I did Rocky Balboa and uh, met and was on set with you know, Sly Stallone and uh, it was a thrill. He's a great dude. He was, but he's directing and starring in the film. But I can still remember going up to him. Like he, there was a certain nuances of how a fighter made his entrance and what the fans would be saying and what my role was. And you know, we were at a fight in Vegas. There was a crowd, and they they gave Sly like I don't know. 15 minutes to say, hey, you can use the crowd, you can shoot, but then you got to be done because then I think it was a Bernard Hopkins fight coming on next and we're ready for a fight, but they gave him 15 minutes to shoot. And I just made a suggestion or two on how to best utilize that time. I said, I hope you don't, you know, uh, I don't want to be presumptuous here, Sly, but this is probably, this is how it's done, how you'd make your entrance. And this is how you could probably do it. Look good on the film, I think. And he said, no, I have you here because you know, I know you know what you're doing. You're helpful. And he actually did it. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it was, it was, that was a ton of fun to meet, you know, a legend like that. And I look back once in a while and I watch Rocky Balboa and I'm like, oh, there I am. Bert Sugar, I'm there. It's, it's a lot of fun. That was 2024 Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame inductee, Brian Kenny. Hello and welcome to episode 84 of the Irish Baseball Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Becker. On today's show, we're going to hear Brian Kenny's conversation with Sean Clancy, founder of the Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame. The full conversation with video is available right now to all dues-paying members of the Irish American Baseball Society as part of the Community Network website. I was actually one of the members who nominated Brian Kenny this past year, and I'm thrilled that he is making it into the hall. I have more than a quarter of a century in broadcasting, and after Vin Scully, Brian Kenny is my favorite broadcaster of all time. I'm not talking about sports broadcasters either. This honor was so greatly deserved. Right now, let's turn things over to our very own Sean Clancy, and his conversation with Brian Kenny. Dad's from Roscommon. Your mom's folks are from Fermanagh. Do you know where in Fermanagh they're from? Yeah, Edderney. I've been there. I've, I've, I've been there. I've seen the family farm right where? near Loch Ern. Okay, so yeah. not far from Enniskillen. No, not far at all. Close. All right, so, so yeah, so basically not far from the border because I, I grew up four miles from the border on the other side of the border. You have fond memories of going back to Ireland during the summer? when you Oh, were my kid? God, yeah. Oh, I, I was there first when I was five years old. Um, saw the family. We're very close with the family that's still there. Uh, first there when I was five, met my grandfather for the one and only time. Uh, my father's father, who never left the homestead, you know, that we were at in Roscommon near Lachlan for, you know, Sean, for like a thousand years. You know, I asked my aunt, how long were we on this land? And she said, what do you mean? Forever. Like we were on that land. There's a, little, a couple of acres, you know, we weren't allowed to own larger parcels of land. So the, the farm was small. Uh, my father grew up there at the house, the oldest of five kids. His father, uh, my grandpa, Dominic, grew up in the house. He's one of 10 kids. Uh, you know, and they, they, he helped as a teenager build the house. They weren't in a house before that. They were in a, in a shed. You know, no water, no electricity. Uh, of course, just, you know, the basics. And uh, so, yeah, I was back there early. Then I went a bunch, a couple of times when I was in my early 20s before I got married. Uh, and then, you know, I got married uh, to my wife, five kids, and uh, just, you know, started living my life, just never got back until years later. Um, and now, uh, over the last, like, eight years, I've, I've been there a whole bunch of times. We go off, and my wife and I were back there uh, just this year. And now we'll go out to the West Coast. We'll go to Ashford Castle. Then we'll go up to Balahadreen, uh, stay above a pub at Durkin's, because my family is still there, cousins, first cousins, second cousins, so cousins once removed, all still there. People that I knew there in the, you know, when I was a little kid, uh, my great aunts, uh, you know, and their children, all there. And I have an aunt in Dublin. So we're back a lot and love going back. I, I go back more often, often if I could. Now, I'd say going there as a five-year-old must have been quite a culture shock because, I mean, we're talking about what, 60s? Yeah, late 60s. Yeah, 1969. You know, so, I mean, it wasn't uncommon for rural houses back then. It was outdoor plumbing and, you know, so so obviously you grew up in a house, you know, you were basically, you were very aware of the, of being Irish. You know, so only later in life did I realize just how hardcore we were because it was normal right. there. Like we were, right, it, there was Irish things all around the house. The Irish music was playing, you know, people would come over my house and they'd go, oh my God, what what is your father speaking like? What, what you, what's with the, the, 
you know, the accent. I go, what accent? And I realized he's a thick brogue mm-hmm. because everybody had a brogue that we knew. Right. It was again, Long Island, um, Irish, Italian, Jewish. Uh, but our circles, and certainly I saw my cousins all the time. We had the Murphys in the Bronx and the Fletchers, you know, out in Suffolk County. And it was, um, it was just normal. Um, only later did I look back and I laughed with my sister, you know, my father passed away a few years ago, just all the Irish songs we had in our head and our kids had in our head. I said, how do you know all those rebel songs? And my kids will say, you're kidding with grandma and grandpa. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. So only later did, from a distance, did I realized just how uh, tied we were to Ireland and how we always had a, a family member flying over as a, as a kid and as a teenager, always had aunts and uncles and cousins come into JFK. You go get them. They stay with you for weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, we had soccer teams coming over because I was playing soccer in lo- you know Long Island tournaments and Irish teams would come over and we would billet them. You know, we'd put them up. Right. And one of those soccer players married my sister. They're still married. So like just all entwined, you know, only later do you realize just how ethnically, um, you know, close we were. Uh, but that was just part of our identity that we didn't question it was normal. Only later do you look back. Now that this generation is just not as tied to it, do I look back and think, wow, they're not as close to the old country as I am. So growing up with that, do you have a favorite Irish band? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's popular bands and then there's other bands. I like the traditional music. Uh, I, I really, I have grown to love it. It's funny. I probably rebelled against it younger. Like, you know, and my sister and I would sit in the back of the car. We'd go, oh my God, more Irish music. And now I put it on and I just, I love it. You know, luckily my wife who's not Irish, loves the traditional music and we can live it, you know, listen to the bands and, um, you know, like um, I, my father loved all fiddle music, right? So we can listen to all the fiddle music. And I, I still like now with Spotify, I'll find different versions of Stack of Rye and I'll just play it. And I'll just start tapping my foot. And it just feels like I, it's in my bones. And when I go back to Balahadrine and they still, that, that used to be the town with like, I don't know, I don't know how many pubs, but they had as many pubs as people. It was one of those towns. And there's still a number of them. And, they, and I'm always telling my cousins, I was like, can you take me where they're playing the traditional music? And you know, I want to hear it. Yeah, I don't know, just any number of them. And of course, you too, um, you know, in the Cranberries through the years, Sinead O'Connor, you know, that, I came of age in the 80s uh, when that was kind of that uh, cultural Irish surge and pride in all of that. Uh, now, do you have a favorite Irish song? I like The Fields of Athen Rye. I'll play that. My father probably played that a lot, a lot. I played it at his funeral, so it makes me cry now, so I can't play it as often as I did. But I, I like that. I like my father played the rebel songs. He yeah. really did. So I heard that. Um, and, you know, there were staunch Republicans. You know, that's why the other hot side of my family came over. They were yeah. on the run. So staunch Republicans, uh, great uncles. I had several great uncles on the run that had to come over to the U.S., had a price on their head. So the, I liked all those four green fields, uh, a lot of the old ones. But again, I'll listen now more to just stack of rye and things that fill my soul. Uh, Rick Vaughn, our good, your good friend and also my good friend down here, uh, he he uh, he said to say hello. But now he said that there's a very cool story about how you met your wife. Is there? I mean, I, it's a fairly normal yeah. story, I think. What, what I don't well, know. I, what, I, what do you know that I don't know? He, he, he said he said it was, a, well, actually, it was his wife said it was one of the most beautiful stories I heard. Did you guys know each other a long time or something? Or there was, um, no, no, I worked with her brother. Her brother was a cameraman uh, with me in local TV, upstate New York. And he had mentioned one time, we, you know, you go out with, your, as you know, I'm the sports director, sportscaster. I'm going out with the cameraman, driving around, doing high school sports, doing Marist basketball, West Point football, and things like that. And we're in the car a lot. And um, you know, obviously I'm talking about, I've got to get my resume taped together. I've got to get somewhere. I want to move in this business. It was my second job. I'd been there a few years. And he mentioned this that is, this is Kingston, Kingston, New York, WTZA. Yeah. It's a fun station. Love being there, but I didn't think I'd be there, you know, five, six years. I've been there five years. And, uh, he mentioned that his sister was an anchor woman. I was like, your sister's an anchor woman. I was like, yeah, she's, you know, um, you know worked in um was an anchor woman in new haven and tulsa and worked for nbc news and was like oh i was like do you think she could help me with with my tape you know do you think she could help me out and i really had no designs on his sister i didn't wasn't thinking that at all. i was just can someone who's been in the business tell me about something i should be doing here um and then that that's how we met went over and um uh went over the house one time and he just he brought me over and we started talking went over my tape and we hit it off very quickly fell in love and were married within a year 
I don't, I don't know what, what what other story we have. I, I, I don't think we have another story. It, it must be the it must be the other Brian Kenny he was talking about. <laughs> you know. It's it's a so fun then, story. Maybe my wife told it better. And then so then basically was it from Kingston to Sports Center? It was actually. You know, and then my wife was instrumental because then I started getting once she started helping me, it's like, you know, dress a little better, get a haircut. Um, like look, this is what you need on your tape. And I started getting offers. And I'm like, hey, you know, I could go to this town, this town. And and she's like, You're not going to any of these places. She goes, You're going straight to ESPN which was preposterous at the time. You know, I'm in Kingston, New York. I said, how am I going to ESPN? And she said, no, you, you're obviously good enough. You're going to go to, straight to ESPN. And it took a few years, but I went straight to ESPN, as she said, and then spent 14 years at, at ESPN as a result. And that was, you know, obviously terrific, a terrific launch. Um, yeah, because, I mean, you went from, what, Sports Center to Baseball Tonight and then basically to the network. But before we get off baseball, um, growing up, favorite team? I was a Yankee fan. On Long Island, that was pretty ballsy. Yeah, I um, I probably uh, went to more Mets games being out on Long Island. It was easier to get to. My father's precinct, and my father was NYPD. He's a detective in the 108, and uh, it was easier to get to Shea Stadium. I probably went to more games there. I fell in love with the Yankees, the Yankee yearbook, uh, Ruth, Gehrig, DiMaggio, the history, the permanence of it, going to Yankee Stadium. And it, this was the old, old Yankee Stadium, right. I remember. Not just the old one, the old, old one, the original one. I, I was there. I was a young kid, but I was there. And falling in love with the the whole his, the historical nature of it and the sense of permanence and greatness. Uh, so I fell in love with that. While also going to see Tom Seaver pitch, you know. And so uh, I recognized that the Mets were there, but I was a Yankee fan. Uh, truth be told, I was a Yankee fan. Well, I, I have a similar story, and I grew up 3,500 miles from here. Um, of the same thing I grew up with. Uh, my parents were back after they got married. They went back, and I had like I call them cousins, but they weren't cousins. And you know, while they were teaching me about uh, you know the Yankees and Motley Crew, and I was teaching them about English soccer and uh, and you too. And uh, yeah, <laughs> for me, it was the same thing. It was like you know the, the the history of the Yankees, especially the history of baseball. But I mean, I will never forget the first place I ever went when I came here in 1991 was Yankee Stadium. And to the till the day it closed, every time that I would walk out, uh, I know I was sat in the upper deck, but I was going to walk out and you see that field and know, know that, you know, that's the same field that Root, Maris, Maris DiMaggio, um, you know, Mickey Mantle, uh, they all played on, you know, was yeah. very, very cool. You but, felt it uh, when you were there. I mean, it was, yeah. that, that was the shame of, I know when they, you know, got rid of the, the stadium, went to the new stadium. I, I, I really felt that. I was like, you'll never, you can never get that back. I, I felt sad about that. And it's funny now, so I hear two people, you know, not that much younger than I am saying, I remember the old stadium. I'm like, oh, the original, like, they're like, no, we're Chris Shambles and Thurman Munson. I'm like, no, 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 that's not the old stadium. Yeah. <laughs> the old stadium is the old stadium. Yeah, with, with, the, with the pillars and the... And the yeah. Pillar. And uh, so now you've made cameos in a couple of boxing movies. So, I mean, the, those residual checks, uh, they must be pretty big coming in. <laughs> they keep coming. You know, I got you know, like Rocky Balboa must have a surge now and then. Um, so yeah, that was nice. I got I, I did Rocky Balboa and met and was on set with you know, Sly Stallone, and uh, it was a thrill. He's a great dude. He was, but he's directing and starring in the film. But I can still remember going up to him. Like he, there was a certain nuances of how a fighter made his entrance and what the fans would be saying and what my role was. And you know, we were at a fight in Vegas. There was a crowd, and they they gave Sly like I don't know. 15 minutes to say, hey, you can use the crowd, you can shoot, but then you got to be done because then I think it was a Bernard Hopkins fight coming on next and we're ready for a fight, but they gave him 15 minutes to shoot. And I just made a suggestion or two on how to best utilize that time. I said, I hope you don't, you know, uh, I don't want to be presumptuous here, Sly, but this is probably, this is pro how it's done, how you'd make your entrance. And this is how you could probably do it. It look good on the film, I think. And he said, no, I have you here because you know, I know you know what you're doing. You're helpful. And he actually did it. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it was, it was, that was a ton of fun to meet, you know, a legend like that. And I look back once in a while and I watch Rocky Balboa and I'm like, oh, there I am. Bert Sugar, I'm there. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, actually, it's funny. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the, you know, I have many memories and great memories of all is, uh, one of the last uh, book launches we did was your Ahead of the Curve, which I was uh, very honored that uh, we were able to do for you at, at Foley's. So now you're the MC at Cooperstown. 
you've been doing that what six years now since 2017 or something like that yeah yeah about five or six years now yeah so as a baseball fan and going there um you know it's got to, it's it's you know it's i i've been lucky enough to have been in a, i've been in a couple of situations where you're in a room with 25 hall of famers and you don't know which way to look and you know or, you know um have you have you had that uh, moment where you suddenly you're six years old again when you got <laughs> to meet some of these guys? It is, um, it's awesome. And even as I've gotten to know all of them through the years, I can still recall, you know, he's just in the lobby and you're having a conversation with Brooks Robinson. Uh, you're talking to Tom Seaver. You're talking to Lou Brock. Um, you see Hank Aaron and his wife. Uh, as they're coming through, and I've had conversations with normal conversations. Al Kaline comes over and starts talking about he's watched my shows. And I'm thinking, did and he leaves, and I'm sitting there, I think, with a couple of writers, and I said, did Al Kaline just come up to me to speak to me? Like, I, I couldn't believe it. So I still pinch myself, and it is the rare air. I love being there and talking to the guys. They're human beings, but to see them all together is is still awe-inspiring, and it is a thrill. I mean, I consider that the greatest honor I used to watch George Grant do it on ESPN, and he did it for the, the MC of the, the ceremony itself, and he did a marvelous job. And I'm trying to carry on that tradition where I'm doing the roll call of greatness, and they're coming out behind me, out on the stage. Uh, to me, it's a it's a thrill of a lifetime. You know, I've been sitting on the back deck at the hotel at the Otisaga, um, and hearing Stan Musial play "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" on his home. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was I was there a number of years with Stan. Came across who is, you know, one of my all time favorites. You know, Stan Musial was probably my favorite all time ball player. Uh, in Hank Aaron, obviously, way up there as well. Uh, and just a thrill to meet him. And again, what a fantastic person. You know, everything said about Stan is is true. And he would break out that harmonica sometimes on the veranda, sometimes right here. I'm in the Hall of Fame now, right in the plaque gallery because they would have a little. Uh, you know, cocktail party after the parade of legends when they would come in, and he would just be sitting there with his with his wife, his children, his grandchildren, and he'd break it out. And uh, you know, Stan would be there, and the Yogi Berra would be over here. And yeah, it, it boggles the mind the things that I've seen. Only in, it doesn't seem like it's that long. It's you know, twenty twenty five years of uh, you know, I mean, coming here for more than thirty years, but to be in an official capacity in that time, and and already, like I think back to the things I've been able to see. Um, and meet the all-time greats and, and see them and, and see uh, it's difficult, Sean, again, to be them. You know, I try to remember that. The, the amount of energy, you know, in my role as a, you know, a celebrity, I get so many people that will come up and want to say hello. And sometimes it's, it's it, you can feel like, wow, I really need a break. So I can't imagine what Stan Musial had to go through or Cal Ripken had to go through or Joe Frazier had to go through. I can't imagine. It's a, it's a responsibility that some are better at than others in carrying. And some of the guys that we mentioned, you know, Stan Musial, Brooks Robinson, Harmon Killebrew, uh, that never had a false moment, like never had a bad beat. And that's difficult to give everybody that energy and the time. And, you know, let me, this person came over to speak to me. Let me, let me autograph something for them. Uh, it's it's endless kind of and it's difficult and so many of these men handle it so well it's admirable yeah without a doubt and uh, having said that um you know of the four that are going in this year uh one uh john and i are taking all the credit for and that would be jim leland because we inducted yeah. him last year into the irish hall of fame nice and, paving and, the way and, <laughs> we, we, I told him, I said, Jimmy, I said, we're, we're paving the way for you. You know what I mean? <laughs> if I don't get mentioned twice in the speech, I'm, we're going to be very upset. <laughs> um, the man couldn't be nicer. I mean, I, I got a chance. Uh, we did a little Q&A with a couple of our members beforehand. And uh, and then I got to, we went on the field, I made the presentation. And then uh, we sat and we watched, I think, the first six or seven innings of the game. And uh, I mean, in the course of that, let's say three hours, he must have been approached at least 50, 60 times. And mm -hmm. he stood up for every picture and he signed every baseball. And and I was just in awe. And I just said to him, I said, uh, I said, well, I turned to the wife first. I said, is this all the time? She's like, Sean, this is all the time. And, um, you know, and and I said to him, I said, Jimmy, I said, does, does, it not, does it not get old? And he says, listen, he said, I used to tell my players all the time. He's like, the time you need to worry, he said, it's the time when they don't. Right. Right. It's, it's hard to keep that perspective, right? It's, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's 
uh, and, and you see like people are so nice when they come up and but I've been with like some of the all time greats and you can hear well, a lot of it is the same story. It's like I watched you with my dad and, my, and we all have those stories and it's the same stories and you think it's e it would be easy to get cynical and just physically tired dealing with it and to not allow that to happen that yeah. takes discipline that takes pride and again the guys at the very top there's a number of them that handle it so well for sean clancy and brian kenny i'm rick becker and this has been episode 84 of the irish baseball podcast